thanks very much. Yes, well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Brown. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at University of Western Ontario, also called Western University. I'm going to talk to you a bit about the Meteor Studies program we have at Western. And unlike a lot of the previous talks, I'm not so much going to focus on uh, specific research projects, but the goal of my talk is to try to convince you to come to Western and study meteors and do meteor projects here. So just by way of a little bit of background, this is a not entirely contemporary shot of the meteor physics group. We have a number of grad students, postdocs, technicians, and three faculty. We study topics within meteor science covering everything from sort of theory, modeling, measurement, uh, celestial mechanics. We have folks from all over the world, about half a dozen different nationalities, and a wide spectrum of interests from very small meteoroids up to very large meteoroids. And just to give you a sense of what the group looks like today, this is just sort of a listing of all the different faculty, uh, postdocs, many of whom you've heard give talks here already this morning, or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, the point again being that there's sort of a wide range of uh, interests and, and uh, subjects that the meteor group studies. And ultimately our large scale focus is trying to marry theory with measurements. So we, we tend to mix those two sort of things liberally. But of course, uh, a lot of our focus tends to be more on measurements because that's the, the input to models that we need to better understand the meteoroid environment. So what's the overall research focus of the group? Well, in a big picture sense, it's small bodies in the solar system, asteroids and comets. The science here then is meteoroids being used as proxies to understand asteroids and comets. But there's also a very practical side, which is meteoroids as satellite impact hazards, much as Deitliff had mentioned earlier about the ESA interest in meteoroids as satellite impact hazards. We work uh, closely in cooperation with the Meteoroid Environment Office at NASA, trying to better characterize the meteoroid environment as a hazard specifically to spacecraft. So ultimately we're using the atmosphere as the detector to better understand the meteoroid background. And as part of this, we have a number of uh, networks and facilities, and I'm really gonna focus mainly on the observational end of what the group does, that looks at everything from sort of centimeter to meter sized objects uh, to sort of millimeter, submillimeter sized objects. We use a range of techniques, optical, infrasound, uh, radar, and the goal ultimately, or one of the big sort of philosophical um, focuses we have is to try to use multiple techniques to look at meteoroids, these different biases that each technique has, to better constrain what's actually going on, to be able to really feed in and constrain uh, observational models. So I'll just start with the very sort of largest scale sizes. We have a, a network of cameras called the Southern Ontario Meteor Network, and there's about 20 stations all over uh, Southern Ontario and Quebec. We uh, populate most of these stations with these sort of small video cameras, the, the kinds of things that uh, video uh, all sky networks have been using for many years. In recent years, we've also supplemented a number of these sites uh, throughout Southern Ontario with a more advanced DSLR based technology that is uh, high resolution fireball cameras developed by the Desert Fireball Network in collaboration with Curtin University. We're also starting to use particularly for flux measurements uh, groupings of more, uh, let's say, uh, recent CMOS based cameras, the sorts of things you're going to hear more about uh, in Dennis Vita's talk next uh, with the Global Meteor Network. And again, one of our big goals here is to try to cue centimeter sized objects being detected over Southern Ontario, and then look at them with other techniques like radar or infrasound and try to understand better how the energy in the uh, hypersonic entry process gets partitioned between these different, um, uh, these different modes. So this is looking at centimeter to tens of centimeter sized objects. At the other extreme, we have a radar called the Canadian Meteor Orbit Radar. And the purpose of this radar is really to monitor millimeter to submillimeter sized objects. Look at the uh, ionization trail left behind by these objects as the, the atmosphere. We want to be able to continuously monitor, get long-term shower activity profiles, and of course, ultimately measure the radiance of many different uh, meteors to try to understand things like the sporadic background, shower outbursts, uh, that sort of thing. And you saw in a previous talk by Orion Egal, the, the use of sort of 20 years of Seymour data, which is continuously monitor the Orion and Zenit Aquarius, that provides a nice baseline to constrain numerical models of a meteoroid stream evolution. That's one of the big uh, purposes or topics uh, for Seymour. So I'm just showing here uh, a movie that's a picture of the radiant distribution from Seymour 
day to day. So what we're looking at is each one of these little dots is an individual radiant measured by the multi-station uh, Seymour setup. And the density of radiance in the sky is measured by the color. So where you see these little enhancements, these are different meteor showers popping in and out. The solar longitude bin is up here. The number of radiance per day, essentially one degree in solar longitude is also shown here as well. And so you can see, we, we're able to distinguish the, the different sporadic sources. And we use these measurements, particularly things like the strength of the sporadic sources, to then feed back into models of the meteoroid environment, trying to better understand uh, exactly what the dust distribution of the Earth is like, often uh, to inform things like models of um, the meteoroid environment for spacecraft hazard. Now, each one of these dots is an individual meteor echo detected by our 30 megahertz system, but many of these objects are actually detected by all three frequencies of CMOR. So CMOR runs at uh, 17, 29, and 38 megahertz. And one of the reasons we look at multiple frequencies is by probing the ion trail at different frequencies, we're actually able to say something about the distribution of electrons within the ion trail. And this turns out to be very important if we want to characterize the mass, the number of electrons that are being produced, and the, the distribution of the electrons. So for example, here's a, a single meteor echo. This is one meteor echo detected at 17, 29, and 38 megahertz. Each one of these little uh, dots or crosses in blue is an individual pulse return from the radar. The radar produces 500 pulses per second. And we're seeing the decay at all three frequencies. But what we can do is we can take a model. This is a full wave model. This is the yellow line here in particular with a Gaussian distribution of electrons. And then we can tune all of the parameters like the initial radius, the velocity, the amber polar diffusion coefficient and force the model to fit all three frequencies. And that gives us a much higher fidelity measurement of the, the number of electrons and ultimately the mass of the meteor. So one of the things we wanna do is take measurements like this and combine it with optical measurements to try to better constrain things that are actually relatively poorly known, things like luminous efficiency or ionization efficiency. So while the radar gives us uh, a handle on the number of electrons that are being produced using this multi-frequency approach, for equivalent sized objects, in the optical, we make use of what's called the Canadian Automated Meteor Observatory. So CAMO is a two-station system that consists of a number of different instruments. There's a, a pair of electron multiplied CCD cameras that see meteor uh, light curves down to about ninth magnitude. There's an influx system, which is sort of a regular uh, image intensified system. And then we have a special mirror tracking system. The mirror tracking system is able to make high precision measurements of meteors with very, very high cadence. And what do I mean by that? Well, here's an example. So this is a one and a half degree field of view. We're tracking the meteor using mirrors that are cued by an external wide field camera. And you can see here the, the microphysics of the breakup. You can see uh, the wake that is left behind in each meteor event. You can see individual fragments. And of course we can actually measure astrometrically the position to within a few meters per event. And since we can do this stereoscopically, we can get very, very high precision measurements of deceleration and light production, and then feed that back into models of meteoroid ablation to get things like bulk density. Furthermore, for a few percent of these cases, we also have multi-frequency radar measurements. So we can get electron production in one chunk of the trail, look at the uh, optical production, and look at the detailed uh, fragmentation breakup. And it's incredibly important to take into account fragmentation when we're trying to understand things like the bulk density for these meteoroids. One minute. So, thank you. So just as a final example, one of the things we do is uh, we have sort of a major program now where we're using the radar measurements to give us estimates of the electron line density for common meteors that are also seen optically with CAMO. So here we have the, the number of photons, here we have the number of electrons, we of course know the velocity. And so we're able to go back and uniquely constrain either the ionization efficiency or the luminous efficiency if we assume one or the other. And so we're trying to do this in conjunction with models like the Borovitsky erosion model and the thermal ablation model to better characterize in particular things like uh, bulk density, masses, and of course, ultimately luminous efficiencies. So if you're interested in these sorts of things, here's a list of a few of the current research projects we have available within the group. Lots of interesting things that cross over from radar to other, other yeah, kinds of measurements. And I'll just end by saying, if you're interested, uh, graduate students, postdoctoral positions uh, are available, so please contact us. Thanks very much.
Perfect. Perfect. Yes, thank you very much. We all have different uh, parameters to optimize. My role is to keep the 10 minutes and a real clap, providing real claps. Uh, so nice results. I mean, this, this, these videos really made my mouth just open. So anyway, is there anyone with raised? Yes, Marcelo D. Yeah. Please unmute you and ask your question. Marcelo. Anyone? Peter, on the last slide, you mentioned aqua acoustic. What is that all about? I've never heard this term. Uh, oh, 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 oceanic detection, yeah. Hydroacoustic, sorry, hydroacoustic. Yeah, so the idea is that in the same way that you have infrasound in the atmosphere, shock waves in the atmosphere can couple either to solid earth, the seismic waves, or hydroacoustically, they can couple to the ocean. So in principle, a meteor shock wave in the atmosphere can couple to the water, and you can get uh, hydroacoustic waves, just like infrasound waves, in the ocean. And there are hydroacoustic stations operated by CTBTO, just like there are infrasound stations. And in principle, we should be able to detect both oceanic coupling of shockwaves from the atmosphere and even meteorite impacts into the ocean. And uh, there's never been a single published detection, but this is an ongoing project, something that we keep looking at. Sounds interesting. I think it would be. Uh, hopefully a student would be interested in pursuing it. <laughs> in the end, we only need a submarine to do grab the meteorite, you know? Exactly, yeah, for sure. <laughs>